All right, well, thank you for joining me today. Uh, my name is Dr. Richard Martinez. I'm a psychologist here at the Counseling Center. And today I am going to talk with you all a little bit about building your social confidence. And this is such a broad topic and one that I run a group on every semester. Uh, but for today, I really wanted to focus on engaging in conversations and some tips and some skills over how to have conversations and approach conversations with others. Because I know that's an area that a lot of people struggle with if you experience social anxiety or any kind of problematic shyness. So that's kind of how we'll narrow in uh, for today's topic. And then we'll, towards the end of our time together, talk a bit about the Counseling Center and the numerous services that we provide students here. So a couple of things to keep in mind as we're going over this, I will have a few questions that I'm gonna ask you all to use the chat function to respond to. And so take a second to make sure you can locate the chat feature. If you have any questions for uh, me throughout the presentation, I will wait towards the end to look at those just because I um, get distracted <laughs> trying to go back and forth. So uh, please submit those via the Q&A function. So that way they don't get buried within the chat as I'm going along here. Um, and just as we're getting started, I have the Counseling Center's information up here on the first slide. And to let you all know that this information that I'm talking about today is uh, very strongly being pulled from a book called Improve Your Social Skills. And that's by Daniel Windler. Uh, so D-A-N-E-L-W-E-N-D-L-E-R. And it's a pretty good book. It's available uh, pretty affordably on Amazon. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Um, let's talk about why starting conversations with others feels difficult. Um, there's several things that probably come to mind, uh, but for a lot of folks, it's, we're assuming that others might not be interested. Oh, maybe we don't know where to start. Maybe we see small talk or having those conversations as being superficial in, this, in nature and not worth it. I'm wondering if y'all could type uh, in the box for me, in the chat box for me, uh, what are some of the difficulties you encounter uh, when you're approaching starting conversations with others? Are there things that you fear? Um, different things that get in your way? Difficulties? Anything that you wanna share? I wanna give y'all a couple minutes to maybe type some of those things into the chat. So again, the question is, what makes starting conversations with others feel difficult for you? And I'm gonna keep people's names confidential, but I'll just share some of the responses we've received. Um, so one of them is assuming that no one is interested. And then if they are, how do I keep this thing going, right? Like, how do I, how do I keep the flow and the conversation rolling? Yeah, very relatable there. Um, someone else says, I always feel like I might be bothering um, the other person or maybe a bother to them and, uh, who they want to start a conversation with, especially if they don't know them very well. Yeah, so we, we oftentimes don't know what the other person's thinking and if they're open to having a conversation or not. I know I'm one of those people who I really look forward to that and enjoy talking with people, especially strangers. Uh, someone else says feeling awkward. Uh huh. Absolutely. So I appreciate y'all chiming in. There's definitely a variety of reasons here and maybe hearing um, some themes around how we feel about ourselves in those situations and how we're feeling other people might be responding to so a combination of those things. All right, let's go ahead and move forward. Um, and this is where small talk comes in. In, in handy. So if we look at what small talk means, let's just start with our definition here. Uh, this is light or casual conversation. Uh, we can also think about it as polite conversations regarding uh, casual topics or things that aren't controversial in nature, um, especially uh, things that are coming up in, in social um, settings or situations. 
And as I kind of alluded to in the last slide, some people might view this as a way to kill time or just something to do at parties or get togethers, but it's also an opportunity to do things much bigger than that. Um, so it kind of prepares you and sets the stage for a connection with somebody else. It communicates interest in this other person and it establishes a common ground, right? With this, with other people. So um, it is kind of like a step towards something bigger or it can be. All right, so like stretching prepares our muscles for exercise. Uh, small talk helps people prepare for intimacy. It helps us get uh, used to each other and used to the other person and settle into a conversation. And it's actually like pretty expected and, and a lot of times necessary uh, prior to going into like deeper conversations. So when we skip the step of small talk, it can kind of like catch someone off guard. So like if I went to a party and walked up to someone and said, what's the meaning of life? Uh, you know, what's the purpose of our existence? you know, tell me more about your breakup. Um, just right off the bat, people are probably like, what is wrong with this dude? <laughs> but that's really when we'd go, you know, we definitely wouldn't jump to 10 in those situations. We'd want to start at a one or a two of like, how's it going? Uh, you know, who do you know here? Um, are you having a good time? I definitely want to start there before going into anything deeper like that. So it's kind of like shaking hands when you meet someone. If you don't do it when they expect it. It comes off across as kind of, it's weird. Okay. So small talk can also uh, communicate our interest. Uh, so what we communicate is more important than what we actually say. And saying something casual can communicate that you like me and you want to get to know me better. Like I said earlier, this really paves the way for a deeper interaction and deeper interactions oftentimes involve risk. So when we share our personal beliefs, it can you know, create risk for an argument. Uh, when we share like a personal struggle that we might have, we risk uh, being getting a cruel response or a cold response from someone else. So we really need to know that it's safe before we go deeper with those individuals. So that's where small talk comes in uh, into play. It's kind of like testing the waters, so to speak, to make sure that um, we're minimizing some of those risks or we have an assessment of those risks before we start to share more about ourselves with an individual. And when you communicate interest, uh, you communicate safety. So we communicate like, I care about you and what you have to say, and I'm open to you sharing it. So a couple examples are like, you know, what do you think of the weather? That communicates that you want to hear my thoughts. Uh, when you crack a joke, that can communicates that you want me to laugh. And these things are not like a perfect guarantee. Um, sometimes people will very, uh, be very pleasant in small talk and still respond poorly when a conversation goes deeper. However, kind of like in general, I'm showing interest um, during small talk helps people move, feel more comfortable to move the conversation towards a topic of more significance. So as I was mentioning earlier, small talk establishes common grounds and it helps you um, discover what you all have in common. Um, so you can find topics that get both of y'all excited, the parts of the story, your stories that you're eager to hear and share. And this will naturally lead the conversation in the paths that are more intimate and meaningful. And not only does this give you a feel for more conversation, but it also helps you form bonds with the other person. When you discover that common ground, you start to imagine life through the other person's eyes. And while those deep, like heart to heart conversations are very intimate, small talk can be intimate too. Um, heart, heartfelt, uh, friendships will begin to form even before the first deep conversation because small talk allowed the friends to read to discover how much they resonate with one another. It's kind of kind of magical in that way. So to kind of sum this up, small talk equals big value. And so it's kind of shifting our views away from seeing small talk as 
busy work or a chore as something that's, that, that has meaning and purpose and payoff in the end. So we'll talk about some guidelines here. So things like, how can I help the other person feel comfortable? How can I communicate interest and friendliness? And how can I discover that common ground? Okay, so we'll uh, kind of break this down by like talking about creating a flow within a conversation, starting to understand context, looking at body language, um, embodying like a confident presentation and knowing when to wrap it up, when to end it. So let's start with flow. Conversation flow happens when the conversation is comfortable, effortless and smooth. Sometimes it can happen automatically, uh, but often it requires a bit of work. In order to create an easy flow, you need two things. The first is an invitation. So when you say something that explicitly lets your conversation partner know when it's their turn to speak. And inspiration. And that's when you say something that makes your conversation partner speak spontaneously. And if you've been in my group before, you know that I use, I use a lot of analogies and I like to the, pull the one about fishing. So inspiration can sometimes be the thing that we get hooked on within the conversation. So like, you know what, we might be casting out our line a couple of times and we might get a nibble, uh, but then not a bite, so to speak. So we're gonna keep casting and trying to find what's something that sparks between the two of us that we really can connect on. And that's kind of the bite on our line that we start to reel in on. But we might have to cast that out four or five times with different topics to kind of see what, what gets the bite, what you can form a connection on. So, uh, uh, and part of that is like how we approach the conversation and, and, and setting up and creating that flow. I have a, a, a metaphor that I'm gonna use to help kind of explain those roles and how it works. So I want you to imagine that you and your conversation partner, you're working in a food job. So in the food industry and you're, you're working at the deli. So half of the ingredients are one, on one side of the counter and the restaurant on the opposite end. The two of you need to make a sandwich. So you decide to stand at opposite ends of the counter and slide the sandwich back and forth across the counter until it's made. So your partner adds the lettuce and slides it to you. You add some mayo and then you slide it back to them so that they can add some turkey. It's a bit strange, but like, bear with me here. Now let's say the two of you are chatting as you work on this sandwich together. Uh, and the sandwich represents your conversation. So kind of like the going back and forth. You ask, how was your weekend? And then fly the sandwich down the counter. Your partner says, oh, it was great. How was yours? And they slide it back to you. You reply, it was fine. And you try to return the sandwich, but it only travels like six inches and then stops down the counter. What happened there? Well, uh, you didn't give your partner a clear invitation or a strong inspiration to keep going. Without either of those things, your partner didn't know what to say next. So they didn't respond and the conversation lapsed, lapsed and the sandwich just stopped going back and forth. So there's things we do to kind of keep that moving back and forth on that counter. Open-ended questions are one of them. So asking open questions, those are actually invitations that allow your conversation partner to talk at length without being limited to a short response. When you ask closed ended questions like, did you have a good weekend? Uh, your conversation partner will likely give you a yes or a no. Since you're looking to have more of an ongoing conversation, a one word response from them is probably not ideal. But when you ask the same question in an open-ended man manner, so asking, what did you do this weekend? This allows your partner to more freely tell you about all the good things that they did or all the fun things. You ask in a way that invites them to share more about themselves. This lets people know that you're interested in them uh, versus a more close-ended, not interested question that really just is a yes or no question. So we want to remember, you know, some things I keep in mind are the who, what, when, how, 
why? Because those are all questions that we start, we can start with that allows for elaboration from the other person. So oftentimes we want to start with uh, more of a superficial topic or line of questioning. As most people want, like I said earlier, don't want to go super intimate or super deep really, really quickly um, if they're not comfortable with you yet. And when you first meet someone, it's appropriate to go from talking about the weather, which is um, very superficial, to then start talking about you know, where they work, which is like a little bit more intimate. So you can kind of see like there's some gradual upping of the, uh, of the intimacy there. So you wouldn't go about like asking about the weather to saying like, how was your breakup? Tell me about your parents' divorce. Uh, probably not a, like a smooth transition there, right? That's jumping from a one to a 10 on that intimacy. And that's gonna make the other person feel uncomfortable. So in general, some of those topics to kind of like avoid in small talk or, you know, it's kind of string away from things like religion, politics, money, uh, those kind of things that can, can um, stir up a lot of strong emotions or feelings. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about understanding context. Let's say you're in a conversation and you notice that your partner has crossed their arms, leaned away from you, and is repeatedly like rubbing their face. That's definitely uncomfortable body language, right? But why are they feeling uncomfortable? Well, there could be a million different things there. Uh, maybe they're uncomfortable because they don't like the conversation topic and they're not feeling comfortable or safe in it. Or maybe they feel uncomfortable uh, because you have spinach in your teeth from the lunch that you ate and they're not sure if they should tell you or how to tell you. Or maybe it has not, something's wrong and it has nothing to do with you. Maybe they have uh, a stomach ache right now or they have diarrhea and they're trying to get, get out of this conversation to run to the bathroom. If you only look at their body language, you don't have enough information really to identify what the source is of their discomfort and what's exactly wrong there. So body language will tell you that someone is comfortable or uncomfortable, but it can't tell you why. That's why you look at the bigger context. So looking at context means three things. The conversation itself. So asking myself, did something in the conversation cause your partner to become more or less comfortable? For example, if your partner's uh, body language changed when you asked a specific question, Perhaps there's something about that question that made them feel uncomfortable. Um, there's also the environment that the conversation takes place in. So conversations don't occur in a vacuum. So we wanna look around the room to see what your partner might be re reacting to. There might be an argument like at a table nearby, or maybe it's super crowded in a stressful room, or maybe their ex just walked in. Uh, those could all be reasons why your partner could suddenly become uncomfortable in that conversation. You also want to consider your um, partner's recent experiences. So that could be their mood. Uh, maybe their day wasn't going well before you started talking with them. Um, maybe they had a rough day at work. Maybe they might be giving off those discomfort signals because they're still thinking about, you know, they got written up or they got fired or they had an argument with their partner before they came to this party. So we wanna definitely take time to look at that context. And uh, you can usually uh, identify a few potential causes for your partner's discomfort in those conversations. And if we can, if it's within our control, we wanna to try to um, you know, remove some of those discomforts if we can and see if they become more comfortable in the conversation. So for example, um, let's say their body um, language signaled to you um, discomfort when you started, when you introduced the controversial topic. We may want to back up and change the topic and see if their body language kind of relaxes. Maybe there's a bad smell in the room. Maybe it's really loud um, because there's so many people talking around you and it's crowded. Maybe suggest changing rooms and going into a different room to, to, to talk and see if they light up after that. Um, Remember that you can't always uh, deduce what's going on, you know, their source of discomfort, and it's usually okay to ask, you know, 
you don't have to be like a detective, but you can even ask like, hey, you know, are you enjoying this? Is everything okay? What's going on? Um, and see if maybe they can tell you a little bit about why they're feeling uncomfortable to see if that's something within your control that you can help um, make them feel more comfortable. Well, let's talk a little bit more specifically about body language. I'm again gonna ask you all to use the chat. What are some body language that you'll um, notice that indicates someone feels comfortable? Can you all think of a few things that you notice when you observe maybe yourself or others? Um, what, what do we do with our body that demonstrates that we feel comfortable or safe? Okay, we got a good, good response here. Making eye contact. Absolutely, that is a huge one. So when we feel comfortable or safe with someone, we're typically looking at them in the eye, um, straightforward. We're not kind of dodging their eye contact or looking across, around the room. Anything else y'all can think of or notice? Yeah, um, someone said that they tend to use a lot of hand gestures when they're comfortable speaking. Mm -hmm. That's that's true. That's true. Especially if we're if we do that way a lot in our families, right? Then then we're feeling comfortable and we feel like we can we can be ourselves around that person. Great. Thank you for those of y'all that um, chimed in a little bit there. Um, I'm just going to go over some highlights here of a, of a few that we can kind of keep in mind. So when someone's demonstrating comfortable body language, they're going to typically be leaning in, uh, moving closer to you, or turning to face you. Uh, when someone feels comfortable with you, they're oftentimes wanting to remove the distance between the two of y'all. Um, so you can think of it as if someone feels close to me, they want to be close to me. And removing that distance can take uh, several different forms. Um, sometimes your partner will lean towards you, which is a good sign. Other times they'll turn to face you or physically scoot closer. Um, they also might want to remove an object that's between the two of y'all. So um, let's say there's something in the way uh, between y'all at the table, like a menu or something like that on the table, they'll move that. Um, or they'll turn their feet towards you. There can also be a tilted head or rested, uh, rested on the hand head, so like you know this, um, or kind of cocking their head shows interest. Those can be some signs of comfort. Let's see, uh, a smile, like a gentle smile, and physical touch. This one. Um, it's a pretty significant indicator of comfort. So if someone's feeling comfortable with you, they're much more likely to touch your shoulder to get your attention or put uh, their hand um, near you or give you a hug when they greet you. And that really does vary a lot depending on individuals. So don't worry if someone's not touching you physically, um, they just might not be a touchy person. Uh, but if someone is touching you, uh, then you conclude that they're feeling pretty comfortable with you. All right, I'm gonna ask the opposite question. So what are some signs you all have noticed of discomfort in body language from others? So what are some signs that maybe you give off to others physically or you've noticed other people give when they're not feeling comfortable? Huh, yes, fidgeting, mm-hmm. Maybe they're feeling, they're looking very restless. Like they're, they want to get up and, and flee. Anything else y'all have noticed? Okay. Uh, no. Oh. Getting less talkative, uh huh. Kind of fading out of the conversation. Um, as if they're losing uh, interest or wanting to change the topic. Absolutely. 
So getting quieter, silent, kind of less chatty. Those are definitely some, some signs that people can send across. Another couple uh, is touching one's neck or rubbing their neck. Um, and so people kind of unconsciously do that at times. Um, so rubbing or stroking the front or back of the neck like this is a common kind of neck touching. Um, and if the person's wearing a necklace or uh, whatnot, they might start fiddle with, fiddling with that too. And that can be a sign of, of discomfort because they're trying to like calm themselves down because they might be feeling a little bit anxious trying to get out of this conversation. Also um, touching one's face or rubbing one's face, um, you know, their forehead, rubbing their eyes, um, playing with their hair, rubbing their lips. All these are behaviors that people do to calm themselves down. And sometimes they'll puff their cheeks and, and exhale too, like they're letting the, the air out of themselves. Sometimes rubbing one's legs, uh, you know, that can also be some like a nonverbal sign or um, wiping the, the sweat off their palms on their pants, those types of things. Um, you know, withdrawing or blocking. So if in a conversation, if they're feeling uncomfortable, um, they may try to pull back or place objects between them and their partner. They may lean away, adjust their chair so they're not facing the person anymore. They may cross their arms or block their chest or cross their legs, um, putting their knee between them and the other person. Um, you know, those aren't all perfect indicators, but they can be some cues there. We also, again, want to look at the feet. So feet pointed away can sometimes be an indicator. The interrupted, interruption hand, um, which can sometimes be like, hold on, slow down. I want you to stop talking, or maybe I want to say something. And so I want to mention this earlier for signs of comfort, but op the opposite is true, which is eye contact. So very little eye contact can often mean that someone's uh, uncomfortable or no longer interested. So if they're repeatedly looking away, if they're shifty with their eyes, um, they might not be paying attention. So let's talk about how you can exude confidence um, when you're talking with others in the way that you present yourself. One of the things that's really important is one smile. So we don't wanna like immediately start smiling and be all uh, smiley at the first gl glimpse of the other person um, with that full smile. Instead, we wanna look at the person's face, soak it in for a second, pause, take it in, and then let a big, wide, warm smile come across your face. Um, and that split second delay it'll actually tell people that your smile is genuine and only for them. Okay, so it feels a little bit more meaningful and less generic. And with your eyes, um, you want to really kind of focus your eyes on your partner's face and not break eye contact, even after he or she has finished speaking. Instead, when you need to look away, do that very slowly, reluctantly, until your eye contact is broken. And that should take uh, one or two seconds. And then once your posture, you should really see yourself um, with like really straight posture, a smile, your body facing forward with straight shoulders uh, and tall shoulders. And then, you know, wanna have like a, a good tone of voice and, and a good loud volume and projection as well. And sometimes a tone can, you, there can be a welcoming tone um, two to your voice. A couple other um, tips that I have here is that we want to be positive. So when we're having small talk with people, I like to talk, you know, sometimes you can, you can um, commiserate around kind of like the traf traffic, you know, around town or things like that. But generally, if you see someone and they're always complaining, it's probably someone that you, you're going to eventually start to avoid. Like I, I like to share a an example of what I once had a neighbor who every time I saw them had something that they complained about. And so it got to the point where I'm like, oh my gosh, here they come, <laughs> which sounds mean, but you know, it's true. Uh, we wanna be positive in those, in those interactions when we're getting to know someone because it, it you know, helps us feel good, helps us look forward to seeing them and building that relationship. 
I like to also use compliments as a way to open a conversation. So maybe I like the band um, on the t-shirt that the person's wearing, I might compliment that, or I like their earrings or their ring or uh, you know the shoes that they're wearing. Oftentimes that can be a good conversation starter. Like, oh, where did you get those? I've had my eye on those. Um, I like those colors, that's really nice. And it kind of breaks the ice and makes someone kind of feel good and lets their guard down a little bit to start to engage in that type of conversation. And we also don't want to just ask questions. We also want to state our opinions and be as detailed as possible, right? Because if we're not giving them any information about ourselves, it's going to be really hard for them to get to know us or to trust us or to feel connected to us. Uh, we may know a thousand things about them, but then when they look back, they're like, oh, I don't know anything about this person um, because we deflected or we didn't go into any of that, the detail. And also when we give them a little information about themselves, ourselves, it gives them something to work with It's they're trying to maintain that conversation flow as well. Um, so that way they know like, oh, you also like this band, okay. And then they start telling you about all the concerts they've seen and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It just gives uh, more opportunities for that, relation, that conversation to flow. And I also wanna just encourage people not to get frustrated with the process because when we get frustrated, we get flustered and then we you know, get overwhelmed or we, we just quit. Um, and instead we just wanna be compassionate and know that this kind of stuff can be hard, especially if we're rusty or we're, we're just learning and practicing. And, and to really think about like the impact the pandemic has had on this. So for a lot of folks they are not maybe as comfortable uh, or as practiced in you know, seeing people every day like they were before. Um, so we're all awkward, we're all rusty, we're all getting used to this. And if we think about it that way, it gives us a little bit more compassion that like, okay, it's okay to be to fumble around my interactions right now because we're all struggling to get back to this sense of normal uh, communication with folks. So a couple of things I want you to keep in mind is how to end a conversation. So uh, maybe you get to the point where it's time to go. Maybe you um, figure out like, hey, this is actually a conversation and I don't necessarily wanna keep talking to this person for X, Y, or Z reasons. Sometimes it's good to have a way of thinking about how to get out of it, right? Or how you end it, because it can kind of feel awkward. It's like, do I just walk away? Um, do I shimmy out of the picture? Like what happens here? Um, so think about what your, your purpose or what your agenda is in, in these conversations. So if you're going to a party, a networking event, or to the bathroom, uh, have an agenda in mind for what you wanna accomplish. Do you want to meet like a significant other? Do you want to create a connection with someone who's going to help you find your first job out of college? Are you just trying to get in there to use the bathroom and get out? Uh, whenever you're trapped in a conversation, you're torn between potentially hurting someone's feelings by moving on and wanting to do something else. So what you want to do is you want to wait for a lull in the conversation. So there's a little uh, verbal cues that we can give. So things like saying, well, okay, anyway, or so, those kind of words really emerge when a conversation is kind of momentarily stalled. Um, so they're turning points where we can either introduce a new topic or we may choose to bring that conversation to a close. As such, they're a perfect opportunity to us, for us to begin to disengage. So the speaker will say, so with an upward lift of the voice, um, hopeful um, of the continuation of the conversation. You answer with a tone of more downbeat finality. So, uh, and then you quickly transition to your exit line. So listen, it's been great catching up with you, but I gotta go, you know, I gotta go to class or I'm hungry, I'm gonna go get some food, whatever you need to, to use to transition there. It can be helpful to bring the conversation back to where you started uh, in the first place. So when possible, this makes for a smooth ending or exit. So did the conversation start by asking someone for their recommendation for a class to take? So you might end with, well, I appreciate the tip. I'll definitely try to get into that class next semester. Um, did it start by someone asking you to take care of a problem at work? Then you might close things off by saying, 
So I appreciate you bringing this to my attention. And I'll definitely send them an email uh, this afternoon to figure out what's going on. So you kind of get what I'm saying there. And you can use an exit line. This is where like kind of having an agenda or an objective, it really helps. Uh, when it comes to the kind of exit line you use, first we want to be honest if possible. Um, so uh, lying or making something up, uh, that can come off as dishonest in the moment. And it can also lead to more trouble later on if the truth gets out that that's not true. Uh, the second, the emphasis, it puts the emphasis on what it is you need to accomplish. So this makes your, ex your exit seem like less of a judgment of the other person. And it's not about them. There's just something you, you really need to do. So a couple examples of some exit lines may be like, well, I need to get, get a seat. I need to use the bathroom before the movie starts. Uh, or I have a question I have to ask before the speaker leaves. Or I've got to get back to work. I've got a deadline to meet today. Or, oh, I want to make sure I say hello to everyone uh, here before they leave or before I leave. That's kind of like a, a good transition there. One of my favorite things to keep in mind is practice doesn't make perfect, but practice makes better. Um, so we really have to set those small goals to practice this kind of stuff uh, in our day-to-day -day life. Um, they will translate oftentimes to like online, but there's really not a substitute to doing this kind of stuff face-to-face. -face. So take advantage of any opportunity in your daily life, whether, you know, next time you're at HEB, striking up a little small talk with the cashier. Um, the next time you're in an elevator with someone else, try using that as an opportunity. When you're waiting on one of the bus stops here on campus for the bus to come by, maybe you're in line, one of the lines at one of the food courts here, and you, you know, those can get kind of long. You're there for a few minutes, maybe turning ahead of you or behind you to strike up a little conversation, maybe getting the class 10 minutes early and talking to the person who sits next to you. Um, you can even practice this with family, with friends or uh, professors that you have. Okay, so I'm gonna transition a little bit now that we talked about some skills there um, to just generally talk about the Counseling Center and what we do and what we don't do. So here at the Counseling Center, we do brief, short, um, problem-focused therapy. And we uh, work with students once every two to three weeks uh, for individual therapy, if that's the recommendation treat, recommended treatment. Uh, we also off offer a really popular group uh, counseling program. Uh, and if people are interested in that, we have the listing of all the, the groups on our website, as, long as, as well as the status of whether those are open or closed. And typically the beginning of the semester is a really good time to reach out uh, for those. We also do a lot of prevention and outreach is like what we're doing today. I'm going out into the campus community and talking about mental health related topics providing education around that. We do offer urgent and crisis um, response uh, services here, consultation and referrals. So sometimes students um, can benefit from um, treatment in the community. We can provide referrals to that or they might need medication. Um, so we can provide referrals to different uh, medication services like the psychiatrist on campus. There are some things that we can't do here. So like I mentioned, we see students once every two to three weeks, and that is short term. So we don't do uh, longer term therapy. Um, there are some mental health concerns that can benefit from weekly therapy or more specialized treatments. And so oftentimes we will uh, refer those individuals to the community for that care. And finally, we don't do any kind of like academic advising. So that can sometimes be different from the counselors that y'all had like in the high school setting or in the community college setting. In addition, uh, we do have like a full webinar series this semester. So if you go to our website, you can see like the whole lineup. I think there's like eight or nine different topics that we're doing um, to start our services. So if anyone's interested in pursuing um, services, uh, there's a couple ways you can connect. Um, the easiest way is to go to our website and we have launched um, online scheduling. So you're able to schedule an appointment. We do recommend that you do that as close to eight o'clock as possible uh, because those spots do fill up um, throughout the day. 
So you can go online, do some paperwork and, and pick your appointment spot. And that's really good for routine appointments. If someone's in, like, if it's a crisis or emergency situation, we do encourage people to call our office. A couple of things to keep in mind is that um, during the COVID surge, we're doing our um, appointments through telemental health. And all of our uh, services are confidential in line with our ethics and the law here in Texas. And there's no additional charges or fees with counseling. And everything, um, you know, your professors can't find out that you came in or your parents and stuff like that, unless you give them written permission to do so and you're over 18, all that other good stuff. So you can see our website here and our phone number towards the bottom of the slide. I wanna take a minute and talk about therapy assistance online. This is a really great program. Um, it's also available at no additional cost. Um, and you can access it from our website. There's an app and there's a, a web-based component that you can do. Um, I work with a lot of students that say like, hey, Richard, I really need some coping skills around anxiety or depression. Well, this is exactly what this uh, service provides. And so it helps. It's like really short um, problem-focused uh, videos and kind of prompts that it helps. Um, teach students um, how, to, how to cope, really, and how to build some skills in this area. And so you're able to access that 24-7. Um, and it, like I said, a combination of videos and exercises that you can apply to your day-to-day your -day life. So it's good if you're like, mm, I don't know if I want to start therapy, but I kind of want some support in this area. I would say start with Tau and see if that's helpful. We also have an at-risk training program so, uh, through Cognito. And this is really, really helpful. Like let's say uh, you have friends that you're struggling to talk to about mental health or you're concerned about them. And um, this helps us practice the language that we can use to help someone who's in distress, uh, offer them support, and then also um, discuss with them different resources that might be available to help them. So you, it's kind of like you're interacting with a, a virtual avatar and kind of choosing different ways to respond to those situations and, and finding language that feels consistent and comfortable to you. And this takes about 45 minutes to complete and you can access this from our website as well. So this last slide here has our phone number, our location within, um, you know, we have two locations. One is in the LBJ Student Center. We also have an office at the Round Rock campus, but um, Students at Round Rock can just call our um, San Marcos Clinic to get started. Our website's on here, and we really encourage people to follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, because that's where we put out a lot of really good mental health information and talk about all of our events. Uh, I do want to do a quick plug that on Thursday, uh, this Thursday coming up, which is October 14th, we will be having a trivia night in George's, um, which is on the first floor of the LBJ Student Center. Um, from 6 to 8 p.m. And we'll be doing trivia questions based on Halloween, mental health, and Texas State in general. Um, so definitely going to do uh, multiple rounds there and we'll be giving out some prizes and some snacks. And so definitely join us if, we, if you're in the area and you want to meet some of us. Um, definitely take that opportunity. So I'm going to pause for a minute and see if anyone has any questions uh, before we wrap up. I did um, plug, so typically I run a group in the fall and the spring semester, it's called the Building Social Confidence Group. If you do struggle with like social anxiety or problematic shyness, it's definitely an option to look into. So you can reach out to us at the beginning of the, semester, of the next semester and say like, hey, I'm interested in this group and I can sit down and talk with you about it and see if it's a good fit. So someone asked if uh, they could get this PowerPoint email to them. Um, if you want to send an email to um, the count, I would say email me um, my, or call our office and get our, I don't want to say, this is going to be um, posted on the web, so I don't want to give my email ad address out on it, but I will definitely back channel you, the person who's asking my email address, and you can just send me an email and I will give that to you.
Any other questions before you wrap up? Well, it was really nice being able to talk with y'all. And again, if you have any questions, just reach out to us. Um, our phone number is on this um, slide. And it was really nice chatting with y'all today. Have a good rest of your day.